Okay, Jesse. Let's pray. Father, we, we always need you and we thank you that you're there for us. And when we speak to you, Father, you hear us. Father, we ask you to help us with all the troubles that we have in our lives. Father, we ask you to help each one of us that uh, that are seeking you, Father, that we'll find whatever we need to please you, Father, every day of our lives and make us stronger, Father, through the problems that we have. Father, right now we have some people we need help with and the situation in their lives, and you know who they are. The wide is one of them, Father, help the situation there and that they'll keep on recovering. And then we have Teresa, Father, just uh, if you'll help her with this chemo, we know that uh, spiritual exercise is more important than physical exercise, Father, and let her put her mind to this and each one of us will do that, that we'll have this ability maybe to have some healing over the things which you give us, Father. Uh, we thank you for uh, also for Joey, Father, that you help them with that terrible situation of death and help them that they can understand that that life must go on and that you're in control of everything and we have a gift for just a little time with each other that you're actually for all your kids, not ours. We love you and we thank you for this time as a Bible study we're having, Father, be with each one of us and let's open our hearts and minds to the truth and that we can get stronger in this lesson. In your son, pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Revelations chapter six. Barbara, why don't you start? Well, let's, before, since this is a new study for us, why don't we start by reading Revelation chapter six? And uh, Marvin, can you give us verse one, please? Okay. Revelation chapter six, verse one, it says here, now I watch you when the lamb opened one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a, boy, with a voice like thunder, come. Okay, verse two, I read. Uh, verse two, and I look and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and we came out conquering and to conquer. Okay, verse three, please. Oops, I thought I wrote that. Verse three, Cora. Verse three, it says, when the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature says, come. Verse four, Cat. Verse four, and out came another horse, right red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. Verse five, please. Chrissy. Revelation six, five. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I look, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scale in his hand. Verse 7, Jesse. Hey, when he had, you only six, right? I thought, Chris, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over Mary Faith, so I'll come right back to you, Jesse. Uh, yeah, verse 6, Mary Faith. Verse 6, um, then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Okay, now seven. seven, Jesse. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. Marvin, verse 8. Verse, verse 8 says, And I look, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death. And he this followed him, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with sword and with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. Verse 9, I read. When he opened the fifth 
So, I saw under the altar the soul of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had for me. Okay. Ten, Cora. Verse 10 says, They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Okay, verse 11, please. Uh, 11. Yes, Kat. Then they were, then they were given, or then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Okay. Verse 12, Chrissy. Bob. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth and the full moon became like blood. Okay, verse 13, please, Mary Faye. Verse 13, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. Okay, Jesse, 14, please. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Okay. Uh, Marvin, verse 15, please. Verse 15 says, Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slaved and free, he them hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. I read for 16, please. Calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide, hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the words of the Lamb. Okay, very good. Uh, give me your basic impressions of what we just read, please. And we'll start with Cora. Uh, I'm kind of scared seeing all of the the, the seven sealed or the sealed that the six sealed that were open or oh, all of them that got open. It seems like it's revealing something that's kind of scary to me. Okay, Cat. I, yes, it's it's a picture of as as we are um, as per our previous this continue uh, continuing. This is a picture of what will happen and looking especially in when especially when opening the sixth seal. Then there were a earthquake and it's it's this is something that is really um, to be afraid of. If you're not with Christ, but if you're with Christ, <laughs> okay. it's a good thing. There you go. Chrissy. It says about the horseman of the apocalypse. <laughs> okay. Mary Faye. It's just, uh, it seems to me that it's like something that will come, a judgment that will come. Like, it is a terrifying one that if you're not a Christian yet, that's like that said. Okay. Jesse, you want to weigh in? Yeah. See, when John wrote to the seven churches of Asia, uh, in verse 10, he saints, and I'm going to read this in verse 6, Revelation 6, 10. Okay. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, how holy and true does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. Uh, there's an attitude there that um, these men, these people have been tortured for a long time, and the Roman Empire has been so aggressive on the, the Christians. And so there's an idea here that, I mean, they want something different, and we they're getting persecuted pretty bad. That We've never seen a persecution as what they're going through, it seems like, at this time. So we can win. There's something going to happen. It says at the very end that we'll get to stand up for it. But at this time, I mean, they, that's what we're, I mean, 
if they want vengeance, kind of like how they've been tortured and different things for standing up for God. Right. Okay. Marvin? Um, for me, it shows uh, how does the tribulation period look looks like, and especially it is for unbelievers who those uh, and to those who um, refuse to re repent and are not into Christ. Okay, Irene. Same like as Marvin, you need to be a servant. Okay. Now, this is a point in Revelations where man, there are dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of interpretations. And there are multiple schools of interpreters and they follow all kinds of bizarre and fanciful explanations of what is written here. Uh, in a sense, you have to be accounted, be rather bold to write or to speak about things for which there may be so much disagreement. But on the other hand, there are some things which I believe brings this study, but are, they are by no means universal. First, there is, we have to have a general understanding at least what the New Testament teaches. Secondly, there has to be a rejection of the notion that this sacred prophecy is some kind of a hodgepodge, mix and match uh, hollow, hollow. There you go. That's what I was looking for. Hollow, hollow, mix, mix, mix of uh, cooked up by the Apostle John. And some of it has been said that it came from Semitic, meaning Jewish folklore, Persian elements, Babylonian mythology, the writings of Virgil, Semitic Hellenistic mythology, the Apocrypha, the Book of Enix. There, there's a lot of people that try to pull stuff in and we have to understand that they're wrong. If these scholars, these alleged scholars, pursue this assumption, they can really un never understand what revelations means, simply because they are seeking a meaning in the wrong place. Thirdly, there is a deep sense of conviction that no brand new doctrine. All right, let me ask you a question. Well, let's talk about it. What year is today? Uh, cat. 2022. 2022. When was the book of Revelations written? If you know both dates, you can go ahead and give me both dates. If not, just give me one. I have no idea, sir. No idea. Okay. There is the late date and the early date. I happen to hold, in my own study, I happen to hold to an early date, which would make it about 67 AD. The late date holds to <laughs> a time frame of about 93 AD. So if we round it off to 100 and say that this is year 2,222, correct? Mm -hmm. That means that there have been 2,100 years since the time of Revelation, 2,122 years since the time Revelations was written, correct? So if somebody came up with a philosophy or an interpretation 150 years ago, what is the possibility that that's the correct answer? Very little, right? I mean, the truth is, if 1,750 years went by since the book was written, and you had to create an interpretation 1,750 years later that none of the other Christians had ever heard of, it's a safe bet that you're not 
reading the right interpretation. Now, you may want to know why I came up with 1,850, right? Because in about the year 1850, a new doctrine was developed, and that doctrine was called premillennialism. Uh, most people are unaware of that. It's a relatively new doctrine, and it's not something that we should put a lot of credence in. What I'm trying to say is that revelations is to be considered to be in complete and full harmony with everything else in the New Testament. For example, the one judgment day of the whole New Testament is not a conception, but the premillennialists have replaced it with a series of judgment days. But the references which appear are such or repeated in the very same judgment day, say singular, singular judgment day. And the fourth mistake that most people make is they attribute the whole book to a period following the return of Christ. That's incorrect. And the other extreme, by the way, somebody help me here. Let's see what I'm going to say. If there's one extreme, we're going to call that the left ditch, where nothing has happened and we're all waiting for the return of Christ. What would the other ditch be? Assuming that everything has already happened, right? Yes. So where do we want to be? Do we want to be in the left ditch or the right ditch? In the middle. In the middle. We want to be in the middle of the road, right? Yes. We don't want to go crazy either way. Uh, John is restricted in his expressing current events. And uh, I think we may have spoken about this already, that there is no... By the way, how many antichrists are there? Many. 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 So, <laughs> I must have been teaching something in this class. Uh, so many. So the idea that there's going to be one antichrist that's going to come at the end of time. And by the way, in the last, I don't know, 50 years of my lifetime, the antichrist was the Shah of Iran. The antichrist was... Uh, Osama bin Laden. The Antichrist has been political figures. The Antichrist has been Pope John Paul. There is no one Antichrist. The Antichrist is anybody who teaches against the doctrine of Christ. And another thing that we need to understand in our head is that the various seals, the trumpets, the bowls, etc., they are not necessarily sequential. They're, that's a big fancy word. Let me see if I've gotten that across. Chrissy, what does that word sequential mean? Not in that necessary order. Yes. It, okay. Teacher Carson. They're not sequential. Most of the opening of the bowls and the seals and stuff are concurrent. Mm -hmm. There's a big fancy word. What does that mean? Marvin? What is it, sir? Concurrent. What does that mean? I have no idea. They're all happening at the same time. They're not sequential. They are concurrent. And if we stick with those five points, we can avoid many mistakes. Uh, some of the mistakes that are out there is that the succeeding events, the seals, the bowls, the trumpets, onward, the truth is from chapter 6, they are a panorama, they are a big picture of parallel judgments. The millennium and the present age are one and the same thing. The true key to unlocking the mysteries of revelations must be sought in Christ. We've spoken about that. 
You guys did a good job of that. When Jesus gave the Olivet Discourse in the book of Matthew and in other scriptural references, we can draw those parallels. Now, I want to be clear. There is much symbolism in Revelation, and it has a double application, just as was clearly the case in the Olivet Discourse. That the known fulfillment of a given passage in some historical event now does not preclude its reference to some final or future event. And that the successive mention, for example, of such symbols as the horses does not really mean that one of them disappeared when the last next one came into view. The various conditions that are symbolized here are manifested concurrently or simultaneously. And the great landmark by which the whole prophecy can be oriented and understood is that of the return of Christ. The resurrection, simultaneous resurrection of the dead and the final judgment. Now, if we don't keep rooted to these understandings, the interpreter's ship is doomed to drift in all kinds of directions. Such assumptions of these are candid and they are confidently, but they come from a lot of study. And we want to make sure, yeah, go ahead, Jesse. Can I help out a little bit with this maybe? Go ahead. Um, okay. I want to read Revelations 22, 18, 19. We know it very well, okay? We know by heart. Okay. Uh, here we go. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto the things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in the book. My, my, the question is, is this, it's like if you was in a place called Missouri, a state of Missouri where in America, you had to show me. You, it's a show me state. You showed me. So if someone says, let's talk about Antichrist. If Antichrist is somewhere or one Antichrist, show me in the Bible. And you can't do that. You can Not see there. me. And so as each one of us, we have to understand how is it, if, if let's just say that, how would this even affect me and you? Each one of us as an individual, are you going to change your life and how you live? That's a question. We should be striving every day to live for God. And that's the problem happened here. These people just fell along like the world does, okay? And what uh, Solomon said one time, what comes around, I mean, what's been before will happen again. And there's some similarities, not, there's no doubt. But what's happened here is not true. Um, you know, how many devils are there? How many Satans are there? Anybody want to try to answer? It comes in a, it comes in a different. What? It comes in a different um, image. Satan. Okay. Now, what I think what I'm, I'm going to try to answer the question. I want to make sure I understand it correctly. How many demons are there? Multitudes. How many? And if you want to use the word Satan there, you can. How many Lucifers are there, which was the archangel who fell from heaven? There's well, only I, one of those. I, 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 I want to read something, okay? And you're exactly right. But people, when they're reading like we do sometimes, we see Satan and sometimes we think about Lucifer. Right. But, in, and, and we're going to see this quite often here in a minute as we keep on going through this book about the devil, the old dragon. Well, if you'll look at, I'm in Matthew 16, 23 right now, okay? Hold on, let him get there. Matthew 16, 23. I'll go, I'm going to start with 22. And you know this, Ernest, but I'm going to go ahead and read it. Go Matthew ahead, you're 16, fine. When y'all get there, we'll read it, okay? But watch what happens here. 
uh, I think it helps us a little bit as we're reading the rest of the Bible and we apply it to some of the, the book of Revelations a little bit, okay? I think it helps us out. So here we go. Then Peter took him, and he's talking to Jesus, and began to rebuke Jesus, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, thou shalt not uh, be unto thee. Now, Jesus just told him that he's going to die at Jerusalem, and he's going to be crucified and be risen the third day. In 23, though, watch what he says to, to Peter. He said, Be turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that are be of God, but those that be of men. I think that's important as we're reading that, the book of Revelation to understand that there's a similarity of what people are and what these different emperors or whatever does, all right? And so these people that are trying to take all this stuff and go somewhere with it and run down that wrong ditch, I think we ought to say, well, prove that to me. Show me that that is for surely what you're saying is right. And that will help me and you be stronger in our everyday lives. Does that make sense, guys? Because people can take things, even the devil can get in people's lives, and it can make it seem so true. Yeah. But when you ask the devil a question, just like he did the Pharisees, when Jesus asked the Pharisees questions, they could not answer him. And because they don't have the truth, we have the truth, guys, and we can use the Bible for that truth. Sorry, Ernest, but... No, you're doing fine. Um... Getting on our topic here, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. God has summoned John to see what he's doing among the nations. The vision of the first seal is probably that of Jesus on the white horse, leading the triumphant church in victory over Satan. Revelations 19, 11, and I don't remember whose read it is, so we'll pick on Cat. Revelations 19.11 Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Okay. Now, we can rest assured that this is Jesus Christ. And it's what color horse? It's a white horse. Uh, this color is going to contrast with the colors of the other horse. And nowhere in Revelations is white used other than as a symbol, purity, holiness, glory. White is never used for anything else in the book of Revelations. And the white throne upon which God sits is one of those. Now, there is a symbolism of a horse also. What might a horse be a symbol of? Chrissy? Symbol of white horse, sir. What might a horse be a symbol of? We'll come just, back, Chrissy. I, go ahead. Give me a guess. It's just a horse. Okay. Mary Faye. I don't know if it's true, but I think it's not the bad luck. Okay. Jesse? It's power. It's uh, resilience. There's yes. so many things about a horse, if you look, and it's always royalty in some way. In some ways, it's royalty. I know we're going to see it in ways, but a lot of times, it's uh, the idea. I know, Ernest, that's probably not where you want to go, but the appearance is royalty in a lot of ways. You have power in some ways, okay? Now, you might not want to use that word royalty, but power for sure. Okay. Marvin? Yeah, it is It is power. No, I, I'm going to go. So I'm going to step on Cora and Jesse and come back to the rest of you guys later. It's war. What are horses used for in this time frame within the contemporary setting to where it is written? Horses represent war. And the white horse, it's a righteous war. For the white horse is indicating that there's truth and righteousness. 
And this war began when Jesus ascended to sit next to the white throne of the Father in heaven. And his disciples began to follow out his commands in Matthew 20, chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. The rider on the white horse was given a full crown. And this is not a crown that was extracted through the atrocities or through the act of war. This crown was a gift of God. Now, a crown in the scriptural sense upon the head of some profane conqueror, some Alexander the Great, uh, Julius Caesar, is just impossible to understand. The only one that fits is Christ. Okay. Can I say something? Go, Jesse. All right. In Matthew 10, 34. Jesus says, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. Right. And when I, and I, I still go to the idea it's power. Okay. I'm saying, oh. it to you. I'm not trying to, but the power of the word of God in Christ is, is a resemblance of power to me. Okay. I'm, okay. I know with me. So I don't that's know. okay. We're good. I mean, we're good. Like I said, I'm not offended. We're going to have these discussions, and yes. hopefully as a byproduct, we can learn through these discussions. Um, give me Revelations chapter 19, verse 11. Since I picked on Kat last time, Chrissy, it's your turn. What is it? Revelations chapter 19, verse 11. 19, 11. I will just read 11. Chapter 19, verse 11. 11. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. That ties into what Jesse gave us from Matthew chapter 23. King of Kings, Lord of Lords is my ASV translation. Is anybody else King of Kings and Lord of Lords other than Jesus Christ? Uh, no. <laughs> say it again, Jesse. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's where it's at. That's what, what's going on here is Christ is leading us, us because we're believers, uh, there, you know what? Give me Second Corinthians chapter two, verse sixteen, and that's going to be Mary Faye. Two verse sixteen. Yes, Second Corinthians chapter two, verse sixteen. Chapter two, verse sixteen says. The one we are in aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life, and who is equal to such a task? An odor of life unto those that are saved, and to others, death. Jesse already gave us Matthew 10 34. Christ came to sin, not peace, but a sword. There is a vein that runs throughout the New Testament. Uh, there are those who will say that it's out of place for Christ because, after all, God is love, and this is absolutely true. However, let me go pick on somebody here. Mary Faye, I'm going to pick on you. Okay. If you have a child, by the way, I live in a land of small women, right? Yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, and it's a non-confrontational society, so people really don't argue and fight a lot, right? Yes? Okay. What I want you to do is go find a mother who's got a baby about this big, single. Mm -hmm. 
and snatch that baby away and see if she'll fight you. She will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. She will? Definitely. Why? Because it's a mother. No mother will let anyone snatch um, her baby. Because she loves her child. God loves his children also. God will go to war. God is love, but he loves us. He loves those who have chosen to be his children. Those who would do harm to us, does he love them also? If they repent, Acts chapter 9, Road to Damascus, Saul, yes. If they refuse, no. He loves I got us. something for you. Go ahead, I Jesse. Hi, everybody go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1. Let's start there. This okay. is a very good place, guys. Keep talking. I'm refilling my coffee. When you look at the 1 Corinthians 10, 1, we're going to, I want you to look at a different picture. Uh, we would, God is love. There's no doubt about it, okay? But 1 Corinthians 10, 1, uh, the Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthian church how Jesus is. And they don't, he doesn't accept this idea of all goody two shoes and you get away with anything or everything, okay? There's repentance on our part. So here we go. 1 Corinthians 10, 1. This is an example set for us, even. Right? Moreover, brethren, I would doubt that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the seas and were all baptized in Moses in the cloud and the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for the drink of the spiritual rock that followed them. That was the rock was Christ. Now, this is all love right here. OK. But watch what happens now in verse 5. But when many of them, God was not pleased. Well, please, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, I could keep on, but and there's a lot of things they did. But God just doesn't accept us doing whatever we want to. There's got to be repentance on our side. And so this, there's a, a strange thing. People say, well, I don't want that God of the Old Testament. Well, the problem is you look right here, Christ was of the Old Testament. He was there. He was the one that was interacting with the God's people, all right? So when someone says something to you, they, they start, God is love, but he wants you to love him. That's the problem. God loves you, but do you love him? And these people did not love him in this First Corinthians or even in Revelation. A lot of those people didn't love him either. Go ahead, Armist. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to notice something here. And uh, I want you to pay attention that this first writer, he has a bow, right? What is the symbolism of the bow? Corn ask me. <laughs> Don't know. Marvin? Oh, wait. Wait. Oh. Um, I don't know. Okay, Marvin, you got any ideas? Fresh out of ideas? Mary Faye? What's the question again, sir? What is the symbolism of the bow? Bow? Yeah, the bow and arrow. The bow. Uh, I have no idea. Too. Okay. What's it do? I what do. does it do? <laughs> well, well, we'll get there in a second. I, I promise we're going to let you in on this one, okay? Cat. <laughs> well, a bow is used to throw an arrow. Very good. It's used to shoot an arrow. But okay. what is the symbolism? Symbol. It's to, hit to hit a target. Perfect. Very good. You're you're getting you're, you're you're dancing right around the right square. Okay. 
Jesse, take the mic. <laughs> okay. When they got this given to them, the, the, when they read this, the Seven Church of Asia, they had an idea how good these guys could shoot with a bow. They could shoot dead on the mark. They could shoot dead on that mark, whatever it was, all right? And, it, yeah. and, and the idea, it was a killer machine. It took care of what it needed to take care of, okay? Close. Uh, what are the two primary weapons of this era of warfare? Bow and arrow. Well, the bow and a sword, right? <laughs> now, if you have a sword and I have a bow, which one of us is go which one of us is going to be on the offensive? Okay. okay. Offensive. Which one's gonna be on you you got your sword and you are defending an area? That's defensive. That's defensive. Mm -hmm. The bow is an offensive weapon. Okay? You can reach out and touch somebody. Without getting close without to them. getting close to them, right? Yeah. Now you may say, Hey preacher, where'd you get that from? Go to Genesis chapter 48 and 22. Genesis chapter 48, verse 22. Mary Fay, is it you? I just read. Okay. Jesse, it's you. Hey, did you say Genesis 48 22? I did. All right. When y'all get here, we're ready. Here we go. Moreover, I have given to the one portion above thy brother, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. The bow is an offensive weapon. The sword allows them to defend the land once they have it. Give me, what do we want to go to next? Uh, First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 18. Marvin. First Chronicle. First Chronicle what? Five and eighteen. Okay. Um first Chronicles chapter five verse eighteen. Yes, it please. Says, it says here the Ubinites, the God the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh had valiant men who carried shield and sword and drew the bow, the bow, expert in war, 44,760, able to go to war. They carried a shield and a sword, but the bow was the offensive weapon. Cora, give me Psalm 712. Psalm? 712. Seven twelve. It says, "If he does not relent, he will sharpen his sword. He will bend and string the bow. His bow. He will bend and string the bow." Zechariah nine thirteen. Chrissy, cat. Sorry. Zechariah. What verse again, sir? Zechariah 9.13. Okay. Here we go. Zechariah 9.13. For I have bent Judah as my bow. I have made a frame, its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece. And wield you like a warrior's sword. Okay. Now, what we have to understand is the visions and revelations, the apocalyptic symbols that are used, or they're taken from the battle scenes of the times of the people. 
spin your mind back to 2,000 years ago. And instead of bows and arrows, I'm talking about M1 Abrams tanks and laser guided munitions. Do you think the people would have any idea what you were talking about? No, siempre no, right? Nope. So why was the time that it was written, why were the symbols that the people would be familiar with used? Because it was for them to understand. This is in the world in which the early Christians lived. We don't need to assume that because the figures, the apocalyptic symbols were taken from such a battle that Jesus will actually launch a military of battle against the forces of evil here on earth. The kingdom of Jesus Christ is not promoted by war. Anyone who affirms such a theology does not understand the spiritual nature of the kingdom of God. Give me John 1836, please. John 1836. And I've cat you and Chrissy swap places. I don't know how you did that. Uh, Chrissy, read that for me, please. John eighteen thirty six. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, and I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Okay, 37, matter of fact. 37, you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. 38, Cat. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Now, we see... There's a crown in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And no class would be complete except I give you a Greek word. And it's a victory crown. The word is Stephanos. Okay. If you're interested, it's S-T-E-P-H-A-N-O-S, Stephanos. And it was given, this crown was given to conquerors who returned from a defeat of their enemies the victorious christ sits on his horse he is going to go forth he's going to conquer the enemies of truth with the powers of the gospel give me romans 116 romans 116 jesse sorry back up for i am not ashamed Hang on, I'll wait till they get there. Sorry. We're there. All right. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation of everyone that will believe it to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The power is what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Marvin, give me Ephesians 2.17, please. sorry okay again um ephesians chapter 2 verse 17 it says here and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near peace to those who are near 
Revelations chapter 3, verse 21, Cora. Revelation 3, 21. It says, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on the throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father in his, on his throne. So you want your Stephanos? What is a Stephanos again? Crown. A victor's crown. A victor's crown. You want your victor's crown? What do you have to do? Remain faithful unto death. Remain faithful unto death. All right, guys. I ran you over. We covered a whopping two verses today. <laughs> I love all of you. If anybody's available, feel free to come to the morning, the, the evening time, Philippines morning U.S. time Bible study. We'd love to have you. It's a different topic. And uh, everybody have a great day. We'll see you again soon, okay? Bye-bye. Have a great day. Take care, everyone.